So, uh, good afternoon to all uh, friends, colleagues. It's an honor for me to be here. And uh, I will uh, talk uh, to you uh, about thought structures. Uh, some basic ideas on the behavior and analysis of cable and membrane structures. Um, these are really basic concepts. I'm sure you all know about that, but I hope you like my personal view of this very basic concept. So, I, will, uh, I used to start uh, asking what have in common structures so, uh, so di distinct as this large uh, substantial <coughs> bridge and this windmill. And besides, of course, the basic fact that they are structures, they are thought structures. And by that I mean those that require the elements to be taught instead of uh, slack or wrinkle to work properly. So I brought here my portable thought structure. Here it's not even a structure, it's a mechanism, it's uh, slack. But then I can tighten it and, and it becomes stiff. And it's stiff because it is taut. So, uh, it is also has this uh, sound like uh, the membrane of a, a drum. So that's why I call to call them thoughts. Uh, also, strings are, are works like that. So they can be black, or we can tighten them. And the, the tighter they are, the stiffer they are. We can hear that the pitch gets higher and higher. And there is something related to stiffness in this. So, just to uh, reinforce the concept, if we consider a signal system, the frequencies of this system goes with the square root of k over m, where k is the string <coughs> stiffness, and m is the mass attached to it. And also for strings, it goes like that. But strings are a continuous system. It has infinite modes of vibration. But all of them goes with the square root of this quotient, n over l over m. And this ratio, n over l, plays a part of a stiffness, which you call a geometric stiffness. You can see it's not related to the material. It's related to the geometry and the internal uh, stress state, or the internal load, n. So, um, We'll, we'll come back about this uh, geometric stiffener later, but I want to stress other basic concepts on uh, thought structures. Thought structures are light structures. So their uh, self-weight is much smaller than the weight they are supposed to uh, withstand. So this is a, a famous picture by uh, Enzo Pinto from Naples, where uh, clearly here we have this uh, concept of light structure. Also, they are right because they, uh, uh, their weight per square meter is much smaller than uh, the wind action they are supposed to withstand. So, uh, sometimes we can even um, neglect their self-weight compared to the wind loads they have to have. And that introduces a a different behavior with respect to traditional structures where the, uh, the foundations have to withstand self load in, in case of light structures, we have anchors that have to hang the structures provided they don't fly away with the wind. Uh, also, they are luminous. So they reflect light beautifully. And they shine like um, Chinese lanterns because of their translucency during the night. Well, they are also flexible structures. And by flexible, of course, all structures are flexible, all structures deform with load. But we can broadly speak, uh, say that stiffness structures, such as a beam, they do not change uh, drastically its shape. Uh, when the load patterns arise. <coughs> On the other hand, a flexible structure like a cable, it drastically changes its uh, shape when the load patterns arise. 
Now, because they are flexible, they must comply to funicular shapes. Those that equilibrate a set of roads without uh, raising bending moment. And uh, this is uh, this picture here is to remind us that these are a very intuitive system for us. Uh, uh, they accompany the man before the man became man. And they, this is a wonderful history of how we have perfected this system uh, with another table and a lot of connections, but of course, uh, the history of these uh, structures is uh, a subject for another time. Uh, instead, I will uh, point out that uh, these uh, load patterns, each load pattern has an associated family of funicular shapes. So, for uh, concentrate loads, we have this whole family of cables or arches, polygonal cables or arches, which are able to withstand the loads without bending. And the same for uh, distributed loads. So we have here this, all this family of cables and arches, parabolic cables and arches, which are able to withstand this uh, uniformly distributed load. Um, now, the funicular shape associated to self-weight is the catenary. And if we rotate the catenary around here, the horizontal axis, we are obtaining a surface, a catenoid. The catenoid is a minimum surface connecting two concentric rings. And it is associated to a uniform and isotropic stress field. So uh, if you consider stresses in whatever direction, they are uh, the same value. See? Now, they also belong to a broader family. We can uh, 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 say the catenoid belongs to the family of conoids with a one-to-one -one stress ratio. So this means that uh, principal ratios are the same, so uh, stresses in all directions are the same. Uh, and of course, we can have different ratios and different uh, catenoid, uh, conoid shapes. Now, are all these shapes possible here? Are all these uh, minimal shapes? Because they, here it's one-to-one -one ratio. Well, let's uh, consider a catenoid with equal lower and upper radius. So it can be shown that solutions for this uh, problem, for this shape here, exist only for a limit age, a limit distance between the rings, 1.32 something uh, times the radius. Now, here is uh, uh, the solution for uh, a distance just below this uh, threshold. And here is the result of the numerical method just above this threshold. It diverts. If you keep, we keep iterating it, and finally we will have uh, uh, an overflow, numerical overflow. And the mesh all distorts. There is no solution above this limit. So in this case here, we see that these are uh, divergent uh, shapes. These are not solutions. And these are not uh, minimal shapes. Here we clearly have divergences. And uh, can we have this shape here, for instance? Yes, we can, but not with uh, uh, an isotropic stress field. So, uh, these are good shapes, but uh, these are not. Well, uh, however, uh, speak, uh, if we get convergent, we will converge for uh, curved, single or double curvature shapes. So, for instance, we can have a single curvature, a cylindrical shape, a double curvature synclastic like a sphere, or double, double curvature anticlastic like this parabola, uh, high part. Now, self-stressed membranes without a transversal load, they are always anticlastic or flat, because they have to obey a uh, Laplacian equation with uh, no external pressure, and this uh, principal uh, stresses must be positive, so radius must be on opposite sides. And self-stresses uh, minimums, minimal surface are associated to isotropic stress fields, those T1 equal to uh, T2. So 
R1 is minus R2. Thus, minimal surface has um, um, zero mean curvature. Pneumatic uh, structures, they are commonly anticlastic. And this is possible because we have this transversal pressure. And with positive Q1 and T2, we still can have uh, 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 radius on the same side of the surface. But they are not necessarily uh, synclastic. We can have uh, pneumatics with uh, regions, syncla uh, synclastic regions, anticlastic regions, and also uh, single curvature regions uh, like in this yellow ring here and in, in the bottom. Um, so it, it's sometimes odd. The uh, first time I looked to uh, Millennium Dome, I said, well, how come this is uh, uh, basically an anti-class, uh, a synclastic shape, and it is not pneumatic? But in this case, all of these states here provide the transversal load. And actually, all of these membrane patches here are anti-classic, almost class, but anti-classic. Assembled, they provide this generally uh, synclastic shape. <coughs> now, there is a paradox that uh, we can point out uh, is that because of the, they have to obey to these funicular shapes, flexible stru structures are also formally very stiff. We cannot uh, <coughs> ask for them any shape you like. Stiff structures, on the other uh, hand, they are more formal flexible like Guggenheim built bow. We cannot have this shape with cables and membranes only. But somehow, cables and membranes are more uh, sincere. They express themselves uh, much in a much clearer way than uh, stiff structures like this one. Uh, and also, uh, the necessity of finding these uh, funicular shapes uh, brings a very peculiar process of design. So we start with uh, an architectural intention, but we have a cycle of design, integrated design and analysis uh, process, where from, uh, we have to start from initial, <coughs> probably non-viable shapes, and find some viable shape uh, for our structure. And then we have all the issue of decomposing the shape into uh, a patch, and uh, constructing it from usually flat panels of fabric. And of course, we have load analysis, which is usually only. So only cycling here, we can uh, arrive to a design solution. Well, uh, nowadays, uh, with uh, good uh, shape finding softwares, this process is uh, becoming more a uh, one-way process. But traditionally, we have to cycle this uh, before we could find uh, a design solution. Let us focus uh, a little on this uh, production problem and more uh, specifically on planification. Now, single curvature surfaces, cylindrical surfaces, they can be flattened without distortion. But this is not the case of double curvature surface. They undergo distortion due to flattening. So if you take like uh, the skin of an orange and you try to fa flatten it, it will rip because the, the material is not uh, flexible enough. Or we could consider the map of the Earth. So in the usual Mercator uh, projection, the areas uh, far from the Ecuador are grossly distorted and we even have um, a singularity where a point here, the pole, is mapped to <coughs> Aligned. So to avoid the singularity and to minimize distortion, we can make slices. The more slices we, we do, the less the, uh, distortion we get. But we can't avoid some distortion uh, while mapping a double curvature surface into a flat one. OK, uh, let's come back to the equilibrium problem. <coughs> Uh, consider a transversally loaded string. If we, uh, as usually in uh, strength of material methods, we try to make the equilibrium in the undeformed configuration, it is impossible because there is this vertical force, uh, external force cannot be equilibrated by the horizontal internal forces. 
Now, we have to express equilibrium in a deformed configuration where here, yes, we can have a resultant of internal forces which equilibrates F. But this is nonlinear. This is how the internal vertical force goes. And usually, when uh, solving numerically these problems, we uh, can put like this, given an external force F, find the displacement such that the imbalance load vector P minus F is uh, zero. And uh, the most traditional method to solve this type of uh, problem is using Newton's method where we uh, start from a gas in displacement and we iterate here uh, this formula where the, uh, it appears this derivative of the unbalanced load, uh, unbalanced, uh, load G with respect to displacement. This we call the tangent stiffness, this is the tangent for uh, this load. And in this problem it comes like this. So for small displacements, this is the stiffness, which is 4m over L. Again, a geometric stiffness which has nothing to do with the material. It is have to do with the length of the, uh, the string and uh, the stress on it. We can extend uh, uh, this to uh, many degrees of freedom. So, uh, but now this is a displacement vector. This is unbalanced load vector. This is internal load vector. This is external load vector. And if we apply Newton's method, we have this derivative here uh, of the external load vector with respect to displacement, and this is a tangent stiffness matrix. Now we can always decompose the internal load vectors in a collection of uh, internal loads, like in this bar here, the normal load in each bar, which is a scalar. We collect them in a vector, and we transform them uh, in nodal loads by a geometric operator. If we do this decomposition, we get three parts of for the tangent <coughs> stiffness matrix. A constitutive stiffness, which stands for a reluctance of the system to change its internal loads given a geometric configuration, this operator, so, uh, geometric operator C. A geometric stiffness, which is a reluctance of the system to change its geometry given a set of loads, and an external stiffness, which is a reluctance of the external field uh, to change. So uh, this decomposition is important, for instance, when you study uh, the stability of the system. Now we can apply this for a cable or truss element. And uh, what's important here is we have this uh, internal force on the nodes and this unit vector connecting, uh, pointing from one node to the other, six degrees of freedom. Uh, and we decompose uh, again in uh, this geometric operator and this uh, internal force, which is just the normal load on the element. And if we assume here uh, linear behavior, then Making derivatives, we get uh, this uh, internal stiffness. A part here is elastic. It's just uh, the axial stiffness, if we consider. This is the spring stiffness of this rod. And then our geometric stiffness, which again appears this M over R. And if you consider this term here, we understand that this stiffness is something transversal to the axis of the element. Now, we can use this uh, formulation, for instance, to solve a hanging cable. Of course, you know it's a catenary solution, but suppose you don't. So we start here for, with this triangular shape, we apply the loads, and in this transversal direction, uh, the displacement is stabilized by this geometric stiffness. So this is the first iteration of Newton's method, where these loads provoke large displacements transversal to the cable. This is the second iteration. These are not, of course, equally viable shapes. But we keep on iterating, and we reach to, uh, this approximation to the uh, container. Well, this is not the only method. Another method we uh, have to remark, which is very popular in uh, cable and membrane structures, is the dynamic relaxation method. 
So we uh, consider instead of the static equilibrium, we, we add fictitious masses and dampings. And uh, for different values of damping, we arrive more uh, quickly or more slowly to uh, the static solution. Now, uh, it's a bit tricky to define this um, arbitrary uh, damping and, uh, and the critical end mass or the critical time step for this system. One way to get uh, uh, rid of the pro problem of uh, damping is to apply cinetic damping. We, we, we just go removing the cinetic energy as uh, soon as they get, uh, they, they pass through, it passes through a maximum. Well, there, there will be some sessions on that, so I will skip the subject. But uh, I will consider here one uh, membrane element that I like, which is a Geary's membrane element, where uh, we decompose these internal Ronaldo loads in loads along the sides of the element. And then again, we can write them, the internal loads, like a geometric operator times a vector of natural forces, these forces along the sides of the element. And here in the geometric <coughs> operator, there are the unit vectors along the sides. And if we consider now the geometric stiffness matrix, it looks very much like the assembling of three uh, cable or two sediments. And here again appears this N over L, L uh, factor. And we, if we <coughs> consider the constitutive uh, stiffness for uh, this element, it is nice if you take the factor of nature of displacement, which are the variations of the size of the elements, is that this uh, nature of stiffness here is a three by three uh, constant symmetrical matrix in the case of linear behavior. So it's like uh, we have this uh, two dimensional spring which goes rotating in place and is transformed by this uh, geometric operator C here. So it's very uh, easy to uh, work with this element. And uh, any triangular face has also a very nice uh, expression, exact expression for the external stiffness, the stiffness uh, provided by the uh, external field for winds uh, constant on, uh, on the element. This is a very um, simple uh, expression. Here is an application, a very simple one. We, we can start with two flat uh, regions, of course it's not a viable, and in one, two, three, four Newton iterations we, we find uh, the equilibrium condition. Here we show also the patterning, here are the uh, planified uh, patterns, and uh, here is the stress field we get in the shape finding process. It's a nice smooth stress field. Now, because we cannot planify a double uh, curvature surface, uh, surface uh, exactly, when we produce this from uh, flat patterns without the residual stresses that we get in the process of uh, flattening, we actually get uh, the original stress field plus a ripple, uh, which can be significant, like 10% uh, or something of the original stresses. We never show this. And we actually never calculate this because we know it is there and we, we cannot get rid of them. But what we could do, make uh, thinner uh, patterns, but then costs increase. Now, um, there is, uh, of course, all we know uh, about uh, the force density method, very famous one, where we come back to the equilibrium of the system of central forces. And it is a nonlinear equilibrium problem. But if we can recognize here these ratios n over L, and if we impose, and we call them force densities, and if we impose values for these ratios here, the problem is linear on the uh, equilibrium uh, uh, coordinates. So 
in very uh, quickly, in only one iteration, we find this very nice shape. In this case, isotropic uh, um, solutions. That means uh, the same uh, density for densities for uh, horizontal and vertical uh, directions here. And also, we can define different uh, force densities for this case and get non isotropic solutions where uh, then we adjust the size of our structure. Now, uh, this is very nice, but it, uh, force density methods require two directional uniform meshes so that we can prescribe in a meaningful way these force densities. What about if we get more general, non-uniform uh, finite element methods and more general stress fields? So that uh, we can manage that, for instance, and it's not the only uh, possibility, but considering again our gear is finite element, and uh, again considering that the, the internal load vectors is uh, the, uh, composed by the uh, normal loads along the side of the elements and the unit vectors uh, along the sides. And again, we recognize that there is this n overall ratio. And we call them natural force densities. And if we define these values, we again have a constant stiffness matrix. And the problem is, again, linear on uh, the coordinates. Now, uh, of course, uh, it's much more clear if we define stresses and then convert stresses to no, uh, internal loads and then calculate internally these uh, natural force densities. But uh, by doing so, we can uh, consider uh, this uh, square primitive and deform it however we want, in one step only, linear solution. Of course, if you want a conoid, we need a hole in the primitive. But you can get all of these shapes in only one step. And if we iterate, very short, a few iterations, like two or three iterations, we get uh, nice um, minimal shapes with vibrotropic stress fields. Or we can uh, impose non-isotropic stresses and get non-minimal shapes. All of this in one iteration. Okay, I, uh, I will skip this. Uh, I don't know how is my time. Okay, so uh, uh, I will very briefly uh, mention uh, uh, some applications that with these elements. Uh, Membrane elements, including in this case wrinkling, and including some sliding cables. We have used it to model this uh, large pneumatics. It is, was used to, uh, to cover the site of a nuclear power plant in Brazil during the internalization of the ground. And here, so is the initial mesh. It's an, not an equilibrium shape, but we find an equilibrium shape under pressure. And we apply different load cases. And what is interesting, if we consider slide, the cable sliding, is that uh, we uh, have uh, not much difference in the, um, if the load is transversal, the wind is transversal to the cables, but it, when the wind is longitudinal to the cables, this displacement here, because of the slippage between the membrane and the cables, are much larger. And the wrinkling we get, so this is with adherent cables, and we, if we compare with the case with sliding cables, we get much larger displacement, and also the wrinkling of the membrane is, is uh, different. It's more, we get actually more wrinkling with the adherent cables than with the uh, slipping cables. And now, this is another uh, interesting case, I guess. Uh, this is more or less like uh, the structure of my, my umbrella, right? Very slender uh, arches 
which are stabilized by the membrane itself. And it, it's an interesting system because uh, we have uh, this arch here, which is supported by this V support here. And it would and there is a ring here and another ring here. It would be enough for uh, a stable solution, but it wouldn't it was not stiff enough, so we have this uh, rod here, which acts actually basically ha like hangers, even though they are not uh, made by cables, they are stiff rods. So for uh, staticity, uh, it would not be necessary to have this rod <coughs> to, to have a cantilever arch stabilized only by the internal ring. And these are uh, two uh, membranes on the top of Urkam uh, mountain in Rio de Janeiro. And this is a very windy place. The design wind load corresponds to a wind of uh, 200 kilometers per hour, so it's a very strong wind. Uh, we have here two membranes. This one is a, a bit older, was designed by Nelson Fiedler. And this one is a uh, brand new, designed, designed by Pedro uh, Santana. And in the case of this membrane, it's far from slender arch, because uh, the wind loads we consider are not uh, funicular to this uh, arch. So we have uh, uh, large bandits. So this is a very sturdy arch. And with this uh, picture where we here, can see the Rio de Janeiro Christ, I uh, end my presentation. Thank you very much.